more easily at times. That it is. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is this session. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this workshop for inviting me to give a talk uh, here. Uh, so, so my title is Gravitational Wave Technology. When I gave this topic uh, title, I had not a good idea what I'm going to talk about. So I gave a very broad, uh, broad uh, title. Uh, but I don't think I can cover all the aspects of the gravitational wave cosmology. I'll just uh, uh, mainly focus on what we are doing or what I'm interested in. Okay, so um, I'll start with a short summary of uh, gravitational observation so far, and then uh, then a broad overview of cosmological applications of the gravitational wave, and then uh, one of the important uh, Topic is the measurement of uh, Hubble constant and the current status uh, is presented. Then uh, I'll move on to the, uh, the topic, uh, the research topic we are working on, which is uh, made, uh, which, which are dark silence in ground based detectors and dark silence in mid band detectors. And, uh, also effects of the eccentricities in the mid band. These are more specific topics. So uh, gravitational wave observation started in 2015 and uh, right after is uh, the beginning of the uh, first observing run, we have detected one uh, black hole binary. And then there have been uh, many, many uh, gravitational wave sources which are discovered by the ground-based detectors. So the, this uh, figure shows the timeline of the uh, observation, observing runs so far. So the first observing run uh, started in 2015 and lasted until early 2016. And then uh, second observing run started in uh, late, late uh, 2016 and uh, until uh, August 20, 20, uh, 2017. And the third observing run, uh, which started in 2019, then uh, ended a little bit earlier than uh, scheduled because of the breakout of the COVID. As you can see that there are three detectors, LIGO, Borgo, and Kagra. And the first observing run was only uh, done by LIGO. Then our Borgo uh, joined in the very last moment of the uh, second observing run. And then uh, third observing run, also Kagra joined almost at the end of the uh, third observing run. So the, uh, the detected sources are summarized in these uh, catalogs, the gravitational wave transient catalog, uh, which has names uh, GWTC1 containing uh, 11 events uh, coming from from O1 and O2 and the up to O3A. So uh, O3 was divided into two. Uh, so three, three, uh, six months each. And uh, the first six months was uh, the, the, the sources uh, detected in the first three months was uh, called added in GWTC 2.1 and then GWTC3, which contains all the sources we have so far. So total number of events is 90. And out of 90, there are two binary neutron stars and uh, three black hole neutron star binaries and two uncertain uh, sources and uh, 83 uh, black hole binaries. So majority of the sources are black hole binaries and uh, there are a small number of uh, sources containing neutron stars. These are the, uh, the diagram showing the uh, masses of the, uh, of, of the gravitational wave sources. So the distinction between uh, black holes and neutron stars are mostly based on the estimated masses. 
So the, uh, if the masses are less than, for example, five solar mass, three solar mass, and then these are called binary Newton, uh, Newton stars. And if the mass is much larger than five solar mass, then uh, there is a definitely black holes. Uh, but of course, we have a lot of uncertainties. And uh, so the, uh, between, between three and uh, five, they are called uncertain uh, sources. Okay. Now, the outlook. So the, we are about to start the fourth observing run. Uh, that was originally scheduled early this year, but uh, uh, moved to May 24th, uh, which is about two months, uh, three months away from now. So the 04, uh, actually it was typo. It, it's going to be 18 months run, uh, split into 04A and 04B of the nine months each, and one month commissioning break in between. So as I said, it will start on uh, May 21st, and uh, one important uh, important thing about the gravitational wave observation is that the data will be released 18 months after the end of each one. So uh, that means the not the entire O4, but O4A and O4B divided into O4A and O4B, and uh, after eight months, uh, you will have a full access to the data, not the raw data, but the uh, calibrated data. And uh, from uh, uh, it, it now works. Yeah, battery is very low. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I continue? Yeah, you can continue. So during this uh, first observing run, we expect uh, to have around 300 uh, black hole binaries and maybe nine events containing a neutron star and uh, one or two multi-messenger binary neutron star. Multi-messenger means the binary neutron star merger uh, with the electromagnetic wave radiation. Of course, uh, from this, this is continuous observations. So we may uh, may have some something we have not expected, but a very interesting. That's what they call nature's surprise. <coughs> and the uh, fifth observing run uh, schedule is a little bit uncertain, although it's, it shows that it will start in 2026. Uh, but uh, this is just a uh, just a, a current guess. And one important thing about this, uh, this diagram is that the, we have significantly increased the sensitivity uh, throughout, uh, through uh, different observing runs. So the number here, 80 megaparsec, is the uh, range of uh, detection of binary neutron star with these detectors. And uh, second observing run, it uh, reached 100. And third observing run, uh, between 100 and 140. And fourth observing run uh, will reach uh, between 160 and 190. So uh, you can translate this into volume. And uh, if the uh, volume increases by a factor of two, you have a factor of two larger number of, of, of detections. OK. Now, uh, let me move on to uh, the actual astrophysics. So uh, from gravitational wave observations, we can uh, determine many parameters, uh, including distances. Uh, this is a luminosity distance, and masses of individual objects, and spin. Of course, the, these, are the, these parameters are not very accurately determined, especially the spin is uh, the uncertainty in spin is very large. Uh, there are two reasons. One is that the, so far, we found that the most of the black holes are not really rapidly rotating. So the uh, spin parameters are relatively small. And uh, also, we don't have, uh, we are observing only the last a few seconds or even less than a second 
observations during which we are not able to see the effect of the spin. So there are many reasons that uh, we don't have a good estimation of the spin. Although the uh, spin is very important parameter in view of the uh, uh, view of, of of the origin of these sources, and uh, uh, it is very important to identify host galaxies because they are all uh, for coming from the uh, external galaxies, and uh, in order to carry out astrophysical researches, uh, including uh, formation mechanisms and the Hubble constant and other cosmological parameters. But uh, as I will show uh, that the, this is a very difficult task and uh, we, are, uh, we are looking various ways uh, of, of identifying host galaxies, either individually or statistically. Uh, so far, uh, host galaxy has been identified for only one event, which was DW17OA17, another type, typo, uh, which is a binary neutron star event. Uh, through the multi-messenger studies. Now, what we can do, uh, what kind of cosmological information we can get uh, with the gravitational rays? Of course, uh, as I said, we can measure the distances to the object. That's, that's very important uh, because of the expansion history of the, of the uh, universe has been based on the measurement of distances and redshift. So the uh, gravitational waves from the compact binaries are called standard siren. Uh, it's uh, uh, instead of standard candles for the optical astronomy uh, because, as the, because the distances can be estimated from the detected waveform and amplitude. I will uh, I'll talk a little bit more details about, the, about this. And um, there are uh, two, two types of the uh, sources. One is bright siren. Bright siren means that the, uh, we observe both gravitational waves as well as electromagnetic uh, waves. Uh, but majority of the sources are dark sirens. We don't see the electromagnetic radiation. We only see the, uh, see the gravitational waves. And uh, we need to identify the host galaxies. I'm repeating this. Uh, because this is very important, in order to measure the redshift and also the, uh, in order to construct the Hubble diagram, etc. cetera. Now, uh, I have a few more items. Um, cosmological parameters can also be constrained by doing cross-correlation analysis between the gravitational wave sources and the galaxies with a known redshift. Uh, also, there is a problem of the uh, gravitational waves. As we heard from the previous talk, uh, the, some inflation theories uh, predict the uh, gravitational waves in the, early, in the early universe. Although we don't uh, usually measure the gravitational waves directly, we only infer the gravitational waves uh, through the CMB. But of course, if we measure the gravitational wave directly, this is uh, very important. And the, this is called uh, primordial gravitational waves. Uh, this is, of course, uh, extremely difficult to observe. And uh, we don't know the details of the primordial gra uh, gravitational waves because there are other, other sources, uh, not only from a cosmological origin, but also comes from the very distant universe. So uh, this, this is... Uh, uh, very interesting topic, but I'm not going to cover these topics because uh, these are not out of, uh, out of my, uh, out of scope this, uh, today. Okay. So how can you measure the distances? So the gravitational wave, waveforms, waveform uh, of the binary merger depend on many parameters as I said, uh, with masses and spins being the most important ones. Uh, these parameters give, also give gravitational wave luminosity. So we measure, measure the parameters just purely based on the waveforms, which is uh, distant in, uh, independent. 
then uh, we measure the amplitude of the gravitational waves. Uh, so if the amplitude is uh, very small, although the masses are large, then it means they are far away and vice versa. So that's how we measure the distances. Uh, the distance estimation from the gravitational waves does not suffer from systematic uncertainty, uh, unlike the use of variable stars as standard candles. So I think you may have heard about the Hubble tension. Uh, Hubble tension is the, uh, uh, the difference between the Hubble constant uh, estimation between CMB and the local measurement are quite different. And uh, so much more than, uh, much more than the statistical uncertainty. Uh, but uh, there, is a, there could be some systematic uncertainty in the measurement of distances based on, uh, based on the variable stars because we uh, have to estimate luminosity of the variable stars. Uh, from other kind of consideration, there is no direct measurement. Uh, but in gravitational waves, the luminosities are measured. It's not measured, but it, they are computed uh, purely based on the uh, Einstein's general relativity. So unless the general relativity is wrong, we have a pretty good uh, the estimation of the luminosity distance. Uh, without any use of the calibration. But there, there is a caveat. Uh, the gravitational wave distance estimation is subject to large statistical uncertainty, which means that individually, you have a large uncertainty in the estimated luminosity distances. Uh, this is because uh, the amplitude of the gravitational waves uh, is very sensitive to the what we call viewing angle. Viewing angle is the angle between the uh, between the uh, line of sight. This is a line. Of, the, the observer is here, and the binary is here, and the binary has the orbital plane. And the uh, viewing angle means the angle between the orbital plane and the observer. That's that's what we call viewing angle, and it depends on the viewing angle very sensitively. So if we are if we are uh, seeing the, uh, the, the binary systems as phase on, the strength is very large, but if, if, if it's uh, 90, 90 degrees from the uh, phase on direction, then the gravitational wave signal is very weak. But we don't have a good way of measuring this viewing angle. So uh, the uncertainty due to viewing angle is very large. Uh, could be uh, even factor of two. And uh, so if there is no other way, we have to rely on the, uh, the uh, uh, statistical reduction of, of the individual distances. So the next question is, can we constrain the viewing angle? Uh, of course, in principle, uh, we have some constraint on the viewing angle. For example, this is the uh, uh, this is the case of GW seventeen OA seventeen that was discovered in twenty seventeen, and uh, this is the orbital plane, and we observe uh, somewhere here, and uh, so this is viewing angle, and depending on the viewing angle, actually the light curve uh, sh should vary. And if we measure the light curve uh, after the merger of, of the two neutron stars, then we can constrain the uh, viewing angle. So th this is, uh, I, I copied this one from the nature paper that we were involved. And uh, we have made some estimation of the viewing angle. But of course, the uncertainty is still very large. So uh, it, it's possible to constrain the viewing angle but uh, precisely constraining the viewing angle is uh, rather difficult. Uh, so this is, is a range that we obtained from the light curves. And then uh, there was a discovery of superluminal radio jet. Superluminal means that the apparent velocity of the jet is uh, 
is higher than the speed of light. That's a superluminal motion. But that's a purely uh, due to the projection effect. Uh, so the uh, having superluminal motion have with the uh, some estimation of the Lorentz factor and the uh, uh, and the speed apparent speed, we have some constraint on the viewing angle. So that was done uh, in, by this group in 2019 after the, the discovery of the superluminal jet from the radio. And then the same group discovered optical, uh, optical superluminal jet that gave even better constraint on the, uh, I think it's constraint is mostly on the Lorentz factor. And so it slightly reduced the uh, range of the viewing angle. So, uh, so th this, this can give the uh, viewing angles. One uh, also important thing is that the very early detection of the electromagnetic counterpart of the binary neutron star merger events, uh, because the after the merger, the, the brightness uh, becomes uh, faint very rapidly. So the uh, if you you don't discover the uh, counterpart very early on, you may lose the opportunity. So uh, early detection is very important. So for, in that regard. Actually, we are constructing the uh, some telescope system, uh, which is called seven-dimensional telescope. And uh, I don't have time to explain why it's called seven-dimension, but uh, it essentially measures many, many different things at the same time. That's why we call seven-dimensional telescope. So it's composed of the uh, 20 telescopes of 50, 50 centimeter aperture each. So uh, this is the rough shape, although it's not a uh, correct configuration, uh, but uh, we have used 20 telescopes. And in each telescope, we uh, put two uh, medium band filters. And then if we uh, observe the sky, same sky uh, with the 20 telescopes at the same time, then we can cover the wide range of uh, of a wavelength of the light with a good spectral resolution. It's not as good as this spectrograph, but uh, we, we can have much better uh, information compared to using the uh, broadband filters. So these thick lines are the um, response curves of the bro broadband filters and the thin, the, thin lines are response curves of the uh, me medium band filters, 40 medium band filters. So uh, we can cover large area of sky repeatedly uh, with this telescope. And, and then uh, this, is, uh, this will give a wide field time domain, IFU type spectroscopic information. IFU means uh, integral field unit, which is a three dimensional kind of uh, uh, spectrograph. So th these are uh, very useful uh, for the identification of great, uh, gamma ray bursts and kilonova. So uh, these telescopes will be constructed in Chile uh, near Cerro Tololo. Cerro Tololo is a peak of the mountain where a lot of telescopes are already located, mostly uh, US. Uh, there is also one Korean telescope in this site, and the altitude is uh, 1,700 meters, and uh, it has 320 clear nights. This is a uh, very good site, considering that the 320 is uh, more than 90 percent, close to 90 percent of the uh, entire year. And the, in astronomy, the seeing is very important, and the seeing is less than one arc second. So the uh, the uh, schedule is such that uh, we already have the production of telescope, few telescopes, and the uh, few of them, two of them will be shipped to Chile very soon, within a month, and uh, we should be able to operate uh, at least five to ten, five to ten telescopes this year, 
that's uh, that's in line with the uh, the false observing gun of the LIGO bug or CAGA. So I said that May 24th is the beginning of the observing observing gun, and we should be able to see the sky even with a small number of telescope uh, from that period. Well, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, telescope will be able to distinguish various types of the, of the galaxy, of, of the object. For example, this is a, a quasar spectrum, and the red is what we might be able to see with the seven-dimensional telescope, and uh, this, uh, these lines are uh, the, the information we typically get with the broadband. So with, with the broadband, we don't have good information about the spectrum of, of the object, but with seven-dimensional telescope, we can distinguish many, many different types of the uh, object. Okay, uh, so the current status of Hubble constant measurement. Actually, uh, this is the uh, probability, posterior uh, probability distribution of the estimated Hubble constant with the gravitational waves, various lines. So, uh, I don't have time to explain, but maybe we can just, uh, sorry, see the, uh, the errors. So with those uh, gravitational wave alone, uh, we have this type of errors, pretty large. And the, uh, we, if we add the, some information about the uh, dark sirens, the, uh, we have some reduction, but this is not uh, that great. And the, with uh, radio and optical superluminal uh, jet, I explained the superluminal jet earlier, and then the errors become small. And uh, the central, the median value, uh, the peak value of the Hubble constant also changed from 68 to 72. So th this is also interesting. But the official value of the Hubble constant from the LIGO scientific collaboration is this, th this is best uh, best number so far we have. So um, assuming the Poissonian noise, if you have just two, then we may be able to reduce the error by uh, uh, scale, scale root of two, which is not also enough because the, uh, the, we need to have kind of 1% one per, one percent accuracy of the Hubble constant, which is uh, less than one kilometers per second per megaparsec. So, uh, so the, we don't have a, a resolution of the Hubble tension so far, but uh, gravitational wave have a potential to, uh, to resolve. Now, uh, the, the most important thing to measure the Hubble constant or any other cosmological parameter is the, uh, the identification of host galaxies because uh, from the gravitational waves, we only know the uh, distances, but we don't know the redshift. So uh, in order to construct the expansion history, we have to measure both distance and, Hubble, Hubble, uh, distance and the uh, redshift. So in order to measure the redshift, we have to identify the host galaxies and uh, we have to use the spectroscopy. But uh, the difficulty is that most of the gravitational wave sources do not emit electromagnetic waves, and the sky localization is very bad. And the most uh, main reason of the difficulties in uh, sky localization is that the, we don't have a really good uh, time resolution because it uh, relies on the uh, triangulation, triangulation, which means that the, depending on the location of the uh, gravitational wave detectors, you, you will have different arrival time. And if you uh, measure the arrival time very precisely, then you can have a, a good information about the direction, at least if you have three detectors. Uh, but the, uh, the time resolution is mostly determined by the bandwidth of the uh, gravitational wave detector, uh, not the detector itself, but the gravitational waves, which is around 100 hertz. Uh, that corresponds 10, 10 milliseconds, and that's not really good enough to make a precise measurement of the, uh, of the position in the sky. So at the moment, 
the, we have uncertainty of between 100 and 1,000 uh, square degree. That's pretty large number. And so uh, also the, uh, the accuracy depends on the signal to noise ratio. So if you have uh, good detectors, better detectors, we can improve the uh, sky localization a little bit better. Uh, but still, if, even if we put all, together all the ground-based detectors which will be constructed or can be constructed within 10 years or so, uh, we still have uh, not so good information. For example, uh, this is the kind of simulation we did. Uh, and uh, maybe we could have uh, just four very strong sources. We could have uh, uh, 10 to 20 galaxies uh, within the localization angle at best. So uh, look, this, this is much smaller than what uh, you, you may expect from the uh, current, current detectors, but still not enough. So BBH post-identification by ground-based detectors are uh, is very challenging. So uh, we we are trying to uh, see the ways of improving the localization. Uh, so it's mostly for the dark sirens because the expected number of bright sirens is would be small, uh, maybe uh, maybe less than ten in next ten years. Also, so that may give you some improvement, but uh, maybe not enough. But if we uh, use the detectors, which is more sensitive, which is sensitive uh, at low frequencies. Low frequency here means uh, between 0.1 and 1 hertz. Uh, that's called a middle frequency, and uh, in, during the mid the Gravitational wave sources actually start emitting the uh, waves at uh, very low frequencies and stay there for a long time and slowly move into higher frequency regime. So for example, uh, if we can observe uh, from uh, 0.07 hertz, uh, then it, we can it observe for 60 days until, uh, until the merger. And if we can measure uh, from five hertz, which may, may be possible in, uh, in Einstein telescope, uh, which is, is under consideration. And then uh, probably one minute compared to uh, second or even less than second. So, uh, so during these long observations, actually uh, we, we can improve the localization through various ways, uh, various reasons. So the, the reasons are relative amplitude and phases of the two polarization so two polarization uh, changes uh, through the time. And if you have longer uh, observational time, then we can use this kind of information to constrain, uh, for example, the uh, viewing angle. And periodic Doppler shift also gives some more information, which means that this, uh, these detectors will be operating in space and they'll be orbiting in the sky, orbiting uh, the Earth or uh, orbiting around the Sun, and then the relatively relative to the uh, to the source, actually the, the motion, the the, the uh, relative motion changes. So that, that gives the variation, and the, uh, the the modulation can be used to see to constrain the direction more accurately. So there are many reasons why we can improve. And so uh, we made some simulations, assuming the, uh, the population of black hole binaries uh, uh, based on current observation. And then as you can see, the distance error. So distance error, error could be uh, quite large, but in this case, uh, if you can observe for long duration, uh, the distance error could, some of them could be very small. Like uh, this is 10%, this is 1%. This, this is, these are uh, binary neutron stars. Also the localization angle, it becomes extremely small, small compared to the uh, previous estimation. 
I mean the ground-based uh, detectors. And that also is more true for the uh, black hole binaries. So the, the, there are many sources with the distance error less than 10%, and the localization of uh, 10 to the minus three square degree. And then you can uh, define the localization volume instead of just a, a localization area in the sky because we have uncertainties in the distance and uncertainties in the uh, localization angle that gives you the, the volume. And the, within the volume, uh, you may expect certain number of galaxies. So these are the assumed uh, gal uh, sorry, galaxy number density. And if you, uh, the number density of the galaxies is 0.01 per cubic mark megaparsec. That's for the uh, pretty massive galaxies. And then th this line is here. And below this line, there are many, many galaxies, many, many sources. So that means that we have opportunity to uh, uniquely identify the host galaxy because there's only one or maybe just few uh, candidate galaxies. And then, based on this information, we can construct the uh, Hubble diagram. And uh, this kind of Hubble diagram can be used to estimate the Hubble constant. So uh, if we have a five so identify, uh, the host galaxy identification of five sources, uh, this is still uh, not satisfactory. But if it's more than 10, then uh, we begin to have the have the ability to distinguish between the uh, different estimation of the Hubble constant, which is correct or not. And uh, this is more detail. Uh, so if so far we have assumed that all the uh, black hole binaries are on circular orbits, but we may expect, uh, it's not a big fraction, but small fraction of uh, the black hole binaries are in uh, eccentric orbit. Then uh, the, uh, we can improve the localization as well as the distance even better. And so this is the, uh, how much improvement we will have in, for the uh, localization. So typically uh, more than 10%, uh, more than factor of 10. So, uh, so this small number of eccentric orbits uh, this, this could be a small number, but they give very precise information about the distances and the angle, and uh, they can be very, very useful for, for the future. But there are some issues. Uh, so we have to observe for uh, 60 days, two months, three months. And during that month, uh, during that long period, they emit a lot of uh, gravitational wave source, source cycles, and we need to have a, a very good uh, waveforms. That's uh, that's not an easy one, but we are working on this. So uh, let me summarize. Uh, identification of host galaxy is very important. Uh, so the follow of the follow -up observation in the electromagnetic wave is obvious, but uh, such sources are rare. Uh, so we have we looked at the black hole binaries. Of course, we need uh, new types of detectors, but there are various uh, detectors that have been proposed. And even in the very early, uh, early type of such detectors operating at uh, middle frequencies will enable us to identify the host galaxies and make a precise estimation of Hubble constant and even the uh, acceleration or deceleration parameters. Thank you. Right, uh, we have a, a couple of minutes or one minute for quick questions. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait. Thank you very much for the uh, nice talk. Uh, I had one question, which was, uh, do you think that uh, these improved measurements of the Hubble constant from these gravitational wave sources might uh, lead us to some understanding of why there are systematic differences between uh, the different existing measurements of the Hubble. Like, will it give us some un kind of ontological understanding of the Hubble tension, or, or do you think it will just give us another number? 
<laughs> yeah, it, of course, it's just not another number, but uh, the important thing is that the, the uh, Hubble constant measurement based on the uh, electromagnetic radiation so far, they have to rely on the, uh, some kind of uh, uh, calibration process, which is, uh, we, which is sometimes uh, difficult to understand. So uh, the important point is that gravitational waves does not have, have the, this kind of systematic uh, uncertainty. You don't have to calibrate uh, unless uh, general relativity is wrong. So uh, that's the only caveat. So if, if we come up with this similar number with the uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation, then maybe we can uh, look up the uh, cosmological model because the CMB uh, estimation is assumes some kind of cosmology. And uh, so we have to modify, maybe we have to modify the cosmology. But you pointed out that the uh, Hubble constant moved to, toward the uh, shoes yeah. results. Yeah, this is uh, still, the, there's a lot of uh, statistical uncertainty. It's just a central value. So uh, I don't, nobody is really, <laughs> Uh, make a big, big point out of this. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, oh, you have, okay. Thank you very much for your wonderful, nice talk. Uh, very amusing to see another measurement of the Hubble yes. constant parameter. So you said the radio or optical phenomenon that helps so, you have yeah. better, I mean, smaller error bars yeah. the Hubble is there any artificial prospective to uh, decrease in the error bars uh, in this yeah. measurement? Yeah, so this 17 OA17, we, we are lucky in many aspects because we were able to detect the both EM and gamma ray, etc. So, uh, but we don't, we are not sure whether we can, we'll have similar luck with the future observations because mm -hmm. this, uh, we may expect a few more, but uh, some of them uh, will not be similar to GW17 or A17. But if there, there is any other, just even one source with this kind of superluminal jet as well as uh, uh, gamma rays, et cetera, then uh, I think we can reduce the error significantly. But still, I, I think at, at this moment, some of them are, are rely on the model so the, uh, uh, one of our efforts is to, to look at the models. So there's some model dependency. I mean, the jets and so on. So, mm -hmm. so, systematic. Yeah, that could give another systematic. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> well, related to this issue, uh, you, you, are, you are planning to make this 7DT? Yes. So uh, would you say a little bit about the uh, operation schedule so that? So, uh, I, I went uh, very quickly, but we will uh, synchronize with the uh, LIGO observing run. So at least in May, uh, when the LIGO observing run starts, our, some of our telescopes also begin to operate. Okay, good. Well, we have uh, many interesting questions, but uh, time is already over. So let us thank the speaker again. Okay, next speaker is uh, Youngmin Kim from UNIST. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> okay. Uh, he's going to talk on gravitational waves and neutron star equation of state. Uh, okay, you have a thirty minute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, I'm Young Ming Kim from UNIST, and first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer of the workshop. Uh, for this opportunity. And uh, today I'm talking about the gravitational waves and the neutron star equation state. This is uh, contains my work. And let me start, let me start with the tidal deformability. The tidal deformability of the neutron star is a uh, physical parameters uh, to uh, show uh, some distortion due to the uh, external tidal field. And the uh, a mathematical relation is like this. The small lambda is the tidal deformability. And I can use this one. This one. Okay. This uh, tidal deformability is only is measured from the gravitational wave vibration. And during the uh, inspire, inspire phase in the binary system, uh, when two neutron stars in the binary come closer to each other, toward each other, and then the tidal effect is getting larger, and then those effect is cum cumulative in the waveform. And then we can see the tidal effect in the from the observation of the gravitational waves. And here is this, uh, some example of the possibility of the tidal deformability. And this y-axis is the uh, cumulative, cumulative uh, wave cycle uh, from the uh, in, uh, wave cycle. And uh, if we want to see uh, at least uh, the effect of the, this tidal, uh, tidal deformability effect, and we need to see at least half cycle from the uh, waveform models. And then up, when we observe up to the about the 600 Hertz and then the half cycle, we see, we can see the tidal effects from the uh, gravitational wave observations. And, and as, you, many of you, as many of you know that the GW70 OS 17 is the uh, gravitational signals from the binary neutron stars. And of course, the, the, we succeeded the DM follow up. And the tidal deformability, the measurement tidal deformability is succeeded like this. The lambda one and lambda two is the tidal non dimensional uh, tidal deformability of the uh, two neutron stars in the binary. And uh, the distribution of the, the two-dimensional uh, two distribution of the tidal deformities is shows in the green regions. Green region result comes from uh, comes from the the uh, equation of state insensitive relations. The meaning is is uh, no uh, uh, no assumption no assumption from the specific equation state, but the, we, in, for this green result, uh, the, some, uh, mass rate, the relation of the mass ratio, compactness, uh, compactness and the tidal deformability, this, that uh, some empirical relation is used. So the, the measurement is like here, but uh, we can also uh, use uh, some uh, parameterized equation of state, for example, the uh, piecewise photon. And when using, when using the, some, uh, some advanced, uh, advanced model based on the piecewise photon, that result shows in the blue line. The blue solid line is a 9% percentile credible region from those, from those the, E, 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 parameterized EOS. And from that, use that, that result, 
we can uh, estimate, uh, we can estimate the some equation of state, empirical equation of state, uh, like the right figure. The x x axis is is a density, and the y axis is a pressure, and then this blue region is the a posterior distribution for the equation of state. At uh, when we using the some uh, when we using the poly, uh, prime derived equation of state. So and this is a title of probability, and uh, we can make uh, we can make the uh, radius distribution from the uh, in uh, uh, some relation between the mass and the uh, mass radius and mass mass radius compactness or something like that. And then uh, the mass uh, radius distribution is like that. And that one is, is uh, the result from the EUS insensitive relations. And then the right one is the using the result by using the parameterizing USs. And here is, uh, you can see that we can me measure the radius from the observation. Uh, so uh, my collaborators and myself uh, uh, want, wanted to study the equation, equation state uh, for describing the, this result. And then we pick up some many some equation of state known well known well known equation of state and also uh, we use the keys keys is uh, 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 empirical equation empirical model based on the density functional theory and then and and this equation is uh, was developed by the Korean collaborator members and then. This uh, blue line, blue solid line, is, is uh, shows uh, well consistent with the result uh, of the of the gravitational uh, of seventeen by seventeen. And the right figure shows the tidal wave probability uh, with respect to the mass, and then the solid line is the, our the result from our model, and then shows different, uh, different uh, location state. And also, uh, we generate, we check the some um, insensitive relations, uh, universal relation of the, for the tidal deformability. And then the tidal, actual tidal deformability is, is, uh, is insensitive, uh, in, in this case, uh, the relation between the lambda and the mass ratio is insensitive in to the equation state like this. And also the mass ratio, the, also the in uh, 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 across around, around the, the equal mass case, the high value probability is also insensitive to mass ratio. This is also our region. But the, uh, some years later, the NICE nicer telescope reported at uh, some result from the PERSA. And then in here, the, the NICE uh, succeeded uh, uh, simultaneous measurement of the mass and the radius. And from, the, from the, this result, we see uh, larger radius for the PERSA compared to the gravitational wave observation. And also for the two solar mass PERSA, also the, it shows a larger uh, radius. It means that this, this result from the NICER is it consists with the, some steeper equation of state. But the gravitational waves, it shows some shorter radius in many uh, the subtle, subtle equations, uh, prepare the subtle equation state. And also, uh, from, uh, and also the, uh, there, is, there was uh, uh, some experiment for uh, measure, measuring the neutron skin thickness of the lab. 
and then from the result and it uh, from this result is reported and uh, it uh, the meaning of this result is that the this uh, PRAX experiment also consists with the hybrid diffusion of state. That is, the, this pluralism is uh, uh, allowed the reason for LISER and PRAX experiment. But the gravitational wave observation is not consistent with the, these results. This is a very interesting point. So the so so I wanted to uh, uh, study the why these differences exist and then how can we uh, describe this this difference or, or how can we uh, merge this result and then we can make the unified result. For this, for this study, oh, this is the so sum summary of the constraints. So the gravitational wave result is consists with the soft diffusion state, but the nicer and PX is consists with the hard diffusion state. So for this study, uh, I'm trying to uh, uh, make uh, some uh, unified result by using the Bayesian inference. Uh, on the observational data and experimental data. And this is my current study. So one example is for the uh, relation between the mass radius distribution and the equation state is right. Uh, I want to show that. Uh, this is one example. The left one is gravitational uh, mass radius distribution of the gravitational wave observation, and the right one is the uh, per mass radius distribution of the pulsar by NICER. And when we adopt the uh, piecewise fault drop and and then make this some um, Bayesian we do some Bayesian inference and then make the posterior samples, then it shows like this result. Uh, this uh, parameter is uh, P1 is the pressure at the junction between the low density and high density. And uh, the gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3 is the uh, Aryabhat index for the piecewise polytrope at the high density. For the three reason at the high density. And it is showing this result. The Log P1 value is uh, somewhat similar between two measurements, two observations. But uh, uh, at the, uh, the parameters for high density is uh, somewhat very different. It means so different mass, dif mass and radius distribution is uh, uh, very, dif very different. Uh, equation state, but this equation state is not good for describing the final nuclei. So, uh, and from the many study for of the equation state and neutral spectrum state, we know that the nucleus symmetry N is very important to uh, uh, important to determine the maximum mass and the radius, something like that. So to describe this uh, nuclear property, we, ad we adopted the uh, PZN density functional. The form is like this, and uh, this meaning is um, uh, energy per nuclear. And this, this uh, form is uh, quite simple, but this model is based on the second force model. That's why that's, that is this model parameterization is directly converted to the second force model, second parameterization. And then we can uh, use this to the final nuclear. So using the, this model, and then we can 
converted to the some uh, nuclear symmetry parameters simply by some speculation and then uh, using the nuclear properties we can make the 3D uh, Bayesian inference we I made it the posterior samples for the uh, nuclear symmetry analysis parameters and for the for the case with the 1.4 solar masses, the result is like that. And then here means statistically the radius and the tidal deformability is it are very is co very correlated with the two uh, nucleus material parameters L and T tau, like this. So this is uh, actually the L is a very low parameters for showing the some correlation with the, the radius and also the lambda tidal deformability. And pulls up the L and tidal deformability and this, uh, this distribution is like that and uh, comparing to the other result from the here and very similar and uh, I'm happy to get this result. <laughs> and also this result, uh, from the this result, we figure out that the, the relation of tidal deformability and the radius has a power law, relation has power law, like this one. And the other, so from the, the other study is it showed like this. And also I checked the, uh, some one thing. The case parameterization is uh, actually, uh, we can ignore the, some, uh, some parameters for the finite nuclei. Only we can use the, uh, some for the nucleic matter. And in that case, the results show like that. But we, if we consider the, some parameters for finite nuclei, and the result is like this. And compared to this, this, and then we can see the difference for the mass and radius or lambda radius and tidal liquidity distribution. Also, the L and T tau is different distribution. In other words, if we measure the precisely the radius and the tidal liquidity, and then we can constrain the L and T tau. The meaning is we can give us some better constraints on the Kirchhoff state, also just some property of the nuclei. And this can be applied to the heavy ion collision. And the Laon is uh, the Korean uh, rare air stop accelerator. And the, uh, among, the, among, among the proposed experiment, the lens is for the project to study the dense matter and the nuclear symmetry, measuring the nuclear symmetry energy and also for the neutron state Kirchhoff state. And from this result, we can apply to the heavy collision simulation. And then if we unify all these things, we can, we can make the, some model of sympathy or we can make some sort of computation and then we can uh, describe more precisely, more precisely of for the some relation of the uh, neutron star physical parameters and then and the nuclear parameters. And for this, uh, we need to measure precisely the tidal deformity and go back to the some observation side, detector side. Of course, with the gravitational detector should be good, good as good as uh, the C, the good uh, physical parameters. But the, uh, at a uh, data analysis side, if using the, by using the some um, noise reduction, noise hunting, and also some statistical method, 
to reduce the noise spatial noise. Through the dumb method, we can uh, make, make better data status, data quality, and then uh, we can get better result from the first step samples. So this is some test uh, with the same injection parameters with on the different data. And left one is data from H1, and right one is data from the L1, Livingston and Livingston and Hanford. And these two data is basically the different detector status. And but the the overall performance of the detector is the BNS range is about the 100 megaparsec and the whole living span is 130 megaparsec. But the neighbor speaking, this should be good. But uh, when injecting the same uh, signals and uh, doing some uh, uh, parameter estimation, the first test, uh, the result, the first test sample is like I got, I got this result. And as you see this, the same injection, but the, for the different uh, dictator status, so we get the different uh, radius distribution. And at least this case is, in this case, yes, uh, even the BNS range is rather, but the, I think the mass station is uh, much more than the Hanford. That is the distribution is, uh, the uncertainty is uh, more on the first samples. So, uh, precise, to measure the precise value of the tidal community, of course, we need to better state take the status, but at, and also we need to some uh, detect the characterization and the denoising something like that. We need those. Uh, we need also need uh, uh, some uh, noise deduction at through the data analysis. That is also important. So. Actually, this is almost done my task. And this is actually my, my final goal. And currently, I'm going to this, uh, get this result. And yeah, so actually, this is actually current, current my status. And then, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so then, yeah, and that is, um, that's, a, that's all my talk, and this is the summary, and just I want to emphasize one thing, that is the, we need to precise estimation of the neutron star, and it is important to study the, the dense matter, nuclear, dense matter, nuclear dense matter, and for this, we need to uh, actually uh, observe more event from the BNS or neutrons or NSDH uh, with the better detector status. And that's all my talk. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we we are taking uh, questions. Any question? Okay. Uh, we have some question from the uh, online. Okay. Actually, uh, the idea uh, relating to the Raon physics is, is quite interesting. So uh, basically uh, the result from Raon experiment can be used 
to uh, make the precise uh, uh, equation of state. And then you, you apply that to the uh, Gravitational wave observations. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, is there some, uh, some people in Laos who are working on this kind of top, uh, project or topic? Uh, there is Other than you, I mean. Yes, some people working on uh, this, but not for greatest ways, but only for, uh -huh. only, for only for this. Yeah, only for the collision simulation side. So, or some, and the, actually, the lens experiment is for uh, the study of the uh, dense nuclear matter mm -hmm. and then the neutron star equation state. And the first one, and as I know that the one important thing is that the measure the symmetry energy oh. error. Yes. Uh, the the lamps are one are ones uh, the one of the plan of the lamps is to measure precise measure the precisely this L, and oh. the case of the this L is very uh, dominant value for determine the equation state. And then for this, so some people expand experimentally uh, working on this and the, and also a few members uh, working on the uh, theoretically by using simulation side. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, there are quite few, yeah, and many people involved in this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is actually the pa many particle physics workshop. So you may, uh, you have a chance to, to say something uh, to a particle physicist or experimentalist yeah. uh, concerning uh, your research actually. So is there some specific uh, issue in, in, in particle physics, which might be a, a might improve uh, your, uh, your research? Uh, actually, uh, uh, currently my, for my study is uh -huh. uh, I only use the hadron equation state, uh -huh. but uh, uh, some later uh, we, I need to more, uh, uh, some different equation state, including the hyper understandings or some, you can also, I cannot apply to the quark star. Mm -hmm. In the case, the particle physics side, I need. Oh. Yes, in the case, I, can, I need some communication with the peoples mm -hmm. working on that. Yes. Uh, is there some other question? Other question? Uh -huh. Yeah. So this first uh, uh, was for yep. the line allow on Taiwan as an input. Uh, can you say more about the Chandra Sekhar uh, map? I mean, the in the in the LIGO ex experiment until now we don't see. I, I don't know. Can you show me um, the Chandra Sekhar map? So what you see from LIGO is about one point four. Solar mass, yeah, uh, neutral star. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether there is no prediction um, from particle physics side because the strong interaction and strong gravity is a very good side. So I don't know if you can say more about. Uh, I don't think it has to do with the saturation of this curve. Yeah, this is actually the. Uh, theoretical prediction, but the uh, observation side, the, this contour. Yeah, in principle, you can motivate. You could able to absorb the other side. Up to the beyond, uh, beyond, uh, beyond the two solar mass. Yeah. But Just for curiousness, I don't know what is the implication for particle physics side if you don't absorb neutron star below, above certain mass. Uh, 
uh, because we, uh, I, I, well, I, I guess Hyunmin is talking about the maximum possible mass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so currently the, currently the keys shows uh, 2.2. Two. Black one is about 2.2, 2.2, 2. about 2.2. And uh, mm. this is consistent with the, the two solemnness, observe two solemnness from the first observation. And mm. But the, so we know that the uh, recently more mass, massive uh, pulsar is observed. And then so, but mm. uh, I'm not sure that is really pulsar, but, uh, but we still, uh, I think there is uh, some still a uh, possibility to uh, uh, going up the maximum mass, but mm. we don't know actually the, the mass neutron star is actually no, as I know, there is no concrete uh, evidence for its existence. So mm. at the moment, the personal observation actually is uh, uh, more precise and then the most of the uh, uh, researchers working on the execution state is uh, focused on the some, some parts of the mm. so At least the two, the over the center, center sexual limit mm. is, is the, uh, I think the, mm, the center sexual limit is 1.4 solomons that is the, no longer some uh, constraint for the execution state, but because we see the over the some deaths of neutron stars, so mm -hmm. we have to so many execution state is uh, uh, modified for describing those measurements. So, mm -hmm. all right, okay. Uh, is there some other question? If not, uh, let us thanks the speaker again. So this morning session is over and uh, we're gonna have lunch time.